have the honor of introducing Jane Beck. Jane Beck first became interested in folklore while an undergraduate student at Middlebury College. She went on to earn a master's and a doctorate in folklore at the University of Pennsylvania. And upon her return to Vermont, Beck produced a long, uh, an amazing amount of articles, radio programs, curricula, slideshows, videos, books, and museum exhibits focused on the culture of the state. Her work has been published in journals and magazines such as Canadian Folklore, Yankee, and Vermont Life, and has been aired on Vermont Public Radio and Adirondack Public Radio. In, 19, uh, in 1983, she founded the Vermont Folklife Center in Middlebury, an amazing, amazing place. Um, in Middlebury, Vermont, and served as its executive director until her retirement in 2007. During this time, she grew the Folklife Center into a robust institution that provides outstanding public education research and archival services to the state. Really, really an amazing resource here. Um, Beck is the 2011 Lifetime Achievement Award winner from the Center for Research in Vermont, which I'm very proud to say. Um, and also, copies of her book are on sale in the back, so feel free to talk to Andy about that at the end of the talk. And um, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is this thing on? Yes? You mean you could hear everything I was saying over there before? <laughs> but you can hear me now. It's funny, I have no sense that it's, um, anyway. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you to the center and uh, Margaret for that rather lofty introduction. I'm not a lofty person. Anyway, I'm here to talk about Daisy Turner. And Daisy Turner, first of all, was a storyteller. And uh, she was in the tradition of the West African griot, who was both a storyteller and a singer, but a historian and a genealogist as well. So he kept the knowledge for the community. And Daisy did the same for her family. Now, I first met Daisy um, <laughs> in 1983, but whenever I, w I was sent a clipping by Margaret MacArthur. I don't know whether any of you know of her. She was a singer and a song collector. And she said she always had meant to go see Daisy and collect some of her songs and stories, but had never gotten there, and sent me a clipping that indicated that Daisy had a number of stories. And I always like to get an introduction to somebody before I call them. But I couldn't get an introduction to Daisy. You can get an introduction to the governor, but not to Daisy. And uh, I began to find out that she had a gun and uh, would sometimes take pot shots at unwelcome visitors. So I decided I would write her a letter. Uh, I spent hours doing that and then waited on tenterhooks for about a week to make sure she read it. And um, then I called her. No answer. Crushed. Waited another day. Called her again. And I get a ringing hello? I knew she was 100, and I wasn't at all sure this was Daisy. I said, Miss Turner? Yes? And uh, so then I began my spiel about how I wanted to come see her, and suddenly she got sick of that, and she turned on me and said, well, are you a prejudiced woman? And I said, I don't think so. Come any time. I said, how about next Wednesday? And we were off and running. And uh, I went to see her uh, that Wednesday, and then I continued to go see her once a week. She was a marvelous storyteller. And I, I didn't know what I was hearing. She was talking in terms of her family's story, and she was talking about Africa, and she was talking about 
New Orleans, in Virginia, and enslavement, and then freedom. And, you know, I, I didn't know what to make of it all. Now, memory and oral history are, tend to get a bad rap. And, but they're also always meaningful. And what happens with memory when you, when a memory is set down, it's, it becomes kind of an emotional, it's the emotion around the event that you seem to reproduce. A memory is personal and subjective. And let me give you an example. I was interviewing um, Gussie Laverne, who uh, grew up on a Moncton farm and would recount the day that she first came home and there was electricity. And she suddenly, she was coming home from basketball practice, the house was lit up like a Christmas tree, and just think how she must have felt, never having seen electricity. And she'd run a little way and she'd cry a little, little, and then she'd run and she'd cry. It was this overwhelming feeling. And she could never tell that story 40 years later without crying. And this is what I mean about the emotion around an event. But these events, <coughs> personal events still have meaning and often serve as signposts to uh, being able to discover historical records around them. Now, as I said, I went to see Daisy once a week, and as I was going to see her, I w at first she wouldn't be recorded, and then she was, um, she allowed it. And, uh, she, she was just, she began to say to me, I want you to write a book. And I said, I, I can't write a book now. But she believed that her story wouldn't be taken seriously until it was in print. And I think she had, I, I, I think that was, certainly um, within our society an important point. But more, t more than that, I think it was important to put it in context, a historical and a cultural context, so that um, we could see really the importance of her story and I actually know of no other family story quite like it, covering almost two centuries. Now, at the center of Daisy's life was her father, Alexander Turner, born in 1845. And he was a magnetic man. He was tremendous, powerful. Um, Everybody liked him, and he was a marvelous storyteller. And surprisingly, once he was freed, he wanted his children to look, he looked back, and he wanted his children to know their roots. And this is very unusual. Um, once uh, many people were freed, they wanted to look forward and, 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 accomplished stuff. Alexander wanted that as well, but he also looked back. He had a series of what I call touchstone stories, and these are pivotal events, um, important moments, critical moments in your life. Again, uh, emotionally wrapped up, uh, but they form the backbone of the Turner story. And for example, uh, and I'll talk about this later, but his most important story was killing the overseer when he could turn his back on slavery and move forward. Now, the Turner story starts 
about 1802 to 1810 when uh, a bride and groom went out to Africa on their honeymoon in one of the bride's father's trading vessels. The, and Daisy always said they went to Cape Town. And I didn't understand, uh, Daisy's family was Yoruba. Cape Town to me meant South Africa. And I didn't see how this was possible. But what I came to understand was that Cape Coast Castle, which is, was the major British fort, and do you remember Obama went to uh, see it? It was all in the news a couple of years ago. This is Cape Coast Castle, and the town behind it is called Cape Town. So, the ship went and stopped at, at Cape Coast Castle and then went on down the coast to the Gulf of Benin. And here um, you can see here's Cape Coast and Accra and Little Popo. And she probably, she went down in a terrible storm. Um, and before the rainy season and after the rainy season, there are terrific line storms, which are known in West Africa as tornadoes. And the ship was overcome. Her husband was drowned, and she was saved by an African chief's son, who was a very powerful swimmer. And the powerful swimmer is an important part of the story, because you don't swim on the coast of Benin. Uh, the surf is too high, the currents are too strong, and the waters are filled with sharks. So she was saved by this Yoruba chief's son and uh, never returned to England or London. Um, at least that was uh, the story. And I imagine she died not too long after she was shipwrecked as life expectancy in West Africa at that time was not long. But before she died, she had a son by her savior and they called him Alexander after Alexander the Great who was never defeated in battle. And it probably indicates that this was a time of warfare um, as young Alexander was growing up. He um, grew up in a Yoruba village and uh, became a trader and then, as Daisy said, got too smart for his own good and began to deal in slaves. And he was captured as a slave himself. This would have been about 1829, 1830. And he was brought uh, to New Orleans by the Phoenix, which was a Spanish ship out of Cuba. He was then sold on the auction block. And the Turner story is cheap because he was arrogant and a troublemaker. He may have been sold cheap also because he, I suspect he was sold illegally. But my point is, here are two points of view. Um, and the Turner point of view is that he was arrogant and a troublemaker, which tells you something about his personality and um, identity. He uh, was sold, he, he probably was sold to a, a trader who took him by mule train up to Virginia where he was sold to John Golden of Port Royal, Virginia. He made a lousy slave, he wouldn't work, and uh, John Golden, who was a sporting man, decided that he would put him to fighting gamecocks and boxing. And here, um, usually it would have been two slaves fighting 
uh, between plantations. This is actually the Tom Molyneux, Joe Cribbs fight, which happened uh, later on. But this boxing tradition, bare fist boxing, was just cruel stuff. Um, there was a lot of drinking, a lot of betting, and it was a pretty rowdy affair. And uh, people say that there were, was more money won on these boxing matches than on horse races. Uh, so Golden was betting on his new slave, who he called Robert. Um, he was able to acquire 750 acres of prime land on the Rappahannock. Now, going through his genealogy, um, I quickly realized he was from a long line of yeoman farmers who didn't own more than 200 acres. Um, and suddenly, he is able to buy 750 acres, which eventually expands into 2,000 acres on the Rappahannock. Um, and there is no indication of any other way that he earned this money. Uh, Robert continued to fight with him, uh, to, to box and, and fight Gamecocks until he killed a Jamaican in the ring. And then he refused to fight anymore. And um, so he was back to his old ways. He and Golden, I guess, had, Golden thought highly of him and uh, discovered he was good with a circular saw and put him to building a wheat barn. A rafter fell on him and um, Robert was killed. I think that the uh, fight where he killed the Jamaican in the ring also affected Golden. Golden um, was a member of the Liberty Baptist Church, and up until 1846, 7, he'd never taken an active role. Suddenly, he takes uh, a group of members of the Liberty Baptist Church and forms the Bethesda Baptist Church, which is based on no drinking. Um, the, doesn't allow the sale of alcohol or uh, allow drinking, which says to me that probably something awful really did happen at this boxing match. Anyway, Golden uh, helped build the Bethesda Baptist Church, and uh, I think that that was probably uh, his atonement. Now, Alec, Daisy's father, was born, as I said, in 1845, and they, he and his family, his mother was the seamstress for the plantation, uh, lived right here, and this over here is, is uh, where the big house was. So he lived close to the big house, and Mistress Golden used to come down to his mother's house for any sewing projects, and her granddaughter was about to have her eighth birthday. She was um, making a dress for young Zephy, and um, Alec, who at this point is five, had been playing with both white and black children. Uh, this used to happen until you were about six years old. And he noticed that he wasn't dressed like the white children. And he went to his mother and he said, why don't I have frilly sleeves? And why do I only have a, a smock on? And why don't I have shoes? And she, trying to comfort him, made him a pair of red moccasins that he loved to strut around in. But he also noticed that she would take them off him any time um, a white person appeared. One day, he was strutting around in them, and Mrs. Mistress Golden comes down 
to see about the dress. She sees him in these red moccasins, takes the moccasins off, throws them in the fire. Alec, who is five, goes berserk, and he bites her, and he scratches her, and he kicks her, and she falls in a swoon, and he's glad. But all he can see is this awful look in his mother's eye, which, and, and she's scared that he is going to be sold off the plantation. Now, this is what I mean by a touchstone story. This is when he first realizes what it means to be a slave. He was not sold off the plantation. And indeed, um, his mother uh, continued to sew on Zephy's dress. And the next day or so, they took it up to the big house and went in through this hall, which is still there today, and it was lined with plates of sweetmeats and cookies and all good things. And they went through there and up this enclosed staircase <coughs> uh, to try the dress on Zephy. It fit fine. Rose turned to her son, and he was already coming down the stairs. And he goes straight to a plate of ginger soldier cookies and is there biting the heads off the cookies when his mother pulls him away. And this time he's in trouble all over again. And the overseer, Pusley, it's actually Presley, but the pronunciation in Daisy's family was Pusley, and I like that much better. It sort of encapsulates the man. Anyway, he was head of the whipping post, and he meets out punishments, and Alec, at the age of five, is given uh, pails of water to carry to these long line of, of slaves working in, in the field. He does that for maybe three weeks and then graduates to taking care of the horses and the sheep and eventually ends up in the milk house. And it is here or behind the milk house, that Zephy, who is a friend of Alex, and she has offered to teach him to read and is teaching him to read, and has also said he should escape away to Vermont, and she's ready to help him, which we don't know whether it was because she was an abolitionist at heart. Probably not. Probably she just liked um, Alec, and maybe she and her grandmother, two generations apart, didn't get on quite as well as they should have. Anyway, she's teaching him behind the milk house um, how to read, and Mistress Golden comes down, catches them, and sends Zephy to the house, and then tries to take the primer that Zephy has been working with Alec, uh, from Alec, and he won't let go. He holds onto it. And so she lashes him with a whip. His blood spatters on the primer, but he holds on. And this primer, when he escapes, he carries it with him throughout the Civil War. So think how important that is to him, another touchstone story. And it is at this point he realizes he, he, he has to be free, and he starts saving up money from the milk house um, to buy his freedom. He, um, as he's growing up, he's also hearing um, all kinds of songs, work songs. And um, he, he's growing into a strapping young man and is helping uh, draw Seine in April, end of March, early April, for about three or four weeks. They um, catch all kinds of fish, which they then salt in the Rappahannock. And he would sing, um, he, he learned um, the, these songs, and he would tell his children um, you know, when they were sung. Daisy had a whole mess of songs. Uh, at this point, 
uh, the Civil War is just beginning, and it's um, 1862, and um, the Confederate, there, there are a bunch of Confederate soldiers camped out on the Golden Plantation, and in a closet, it says 1862, and then you see two bed quilts, um, a white count, two white counterpanes, father's blanket. It brings you right into the story when you, you're in this plantation house. At the same time, that uh, there were soldiers on the plantation across the Rappahannock River, there um, was the first New Jersey cavalry. And Ferdinand Dayton, who was the assistant surgeon, uh, came across the river in a boat and met Alec. And Alec told his children later he didn't know why he was so brave, but he talked to Ferdinand Dayton about escaping. And it was arranged that when he waved a white bed sheet, Dayton would come across and would gather up um, Alec and the friends that he had that wanted to escape. And this is exactly what happened, although when the time came, it was only two or three uh, boys. And Alec, at that point, was about 16. Now, this guy here was the, Roderick was the captain. And um, he heard Alec and another friend talking that there was an outpost of nine soldiers at the Golden Plantation. And he, gets a volunteer group of about 20 people, and Alec helps him take them um, back, lead them back across the Rappahannock to the Tom Golden plantation, um, Al, uh, John Golden's son. And um, they capture this outpost of soldiers at his plantation. And as they're doing that, Alec sneaks off and goes half a mile to the house where the overseer lives, Pusley, and shoots him. And this becomes his most important story. This is how he deals with slavery, both figur figuratively and physically. And he is then able to turn his back he goes with and becomes an orderly for Ferdinand Dayton, fights um, in a number of battles, ending with Gettysburg. And then Dayton uh, signs up again for the second New Jersey Cavalry. Alec again is to go with him. They are uh, um, in Arlington waiting for orders. Alec is given a furlough and the orders come through. So the second New Jersey Cavalry moves out and poor old Alec is left behind. Just think how he must have felt. And the interesting thing, he, he went to City Point, he was sent to City Point and he spent uh, the next year and a half there. There are no stories about that at all. And I don't know whether it's because his children all just liked the war stories or whether he, it was just a low point in his life and he didn't choose to talk about it. I only found this out through a scribbled note on his, on his application for pension. The interesting thing, though, is that after the war was over, Dayton came back and found him, took him back to New Jersey, got him a job, got him into night school, for, and, and he spent two years in night school. Dayton, unfortunately, died. And um, after two years of night school, Alec returned to Washington and through the Freedmen's Bureau, went um, to work for A.H. <coughs> Merrill, who ran a slate quarry in Maine. And um, there are all 
kinds of records, um, pay, pay records of the slate quarry. And Alec did incredibly well there. He brought, he, the, the, he was one of 38 newly freed men that went there. And he obviously became um, an overseer or a superintendent or whatever the vocabulary is for a crew in the slate quarry. And um, he w was a leader. And he also was the top wage earner for five years straight, which just shows you the kind of resolve that he had. Uh, toward the end of five years, there were only a very few freedmen left. The winters were cold, um, and they died of pneumonia, and uh, Merrill had to go bring uh, people, uh, bring in Swedes from another place in Maine. And here you see Alec is demoted, uh, probably a good example of racism. And um, the interesting thing is he just humps his back, works harder than ever, and pretty soon is making $50 a week again. Now the wages are $1.50 a, a, <clears throat> an hour, a, a day. Now, it is at this point that Alec marries Sally, uh, who at that point was a young girl of 14. And um, Merrill dresses him um, in his finest and also dresses Sally. Unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of Sally at that age, but she was a beautiful woman. And, um, she accompanied him to Maine. They had twins and then a third child. And she, being so young, really was clinging to life and um, had bad tuberculosis. And um, Merrill helped Alec get her to a doctor in Boston, got Alec a job at the uh, North Station loading freight. And um, Alec, at this point, is scanning the newspapers um, for possible jobs and discovers that there is such a job uh, with Charles White in Vermont, in Grafton, Vermont. And he goes to Grafton. He likes what he sees. He likes the men. They um, tell him that he's not going to be able to earn enough money to put salt in his bread, salt being an expensive item. Uh, and he's determined to prove them wrong. So he finds out that Vermonters all use three and a half pound axes and he has a, a four pound axe made. And um, he cuts piles of wood, and uh, his conduit into the town was through the general store, and he would help uh, Bill Wyman unload barrels of flour and freight and stuff. And one day he's unloading a barrel of flour, and, or several, and he says, you know, I'd like to buy 10 pounds of that for Sally. And Bill Wyman says to him, well, if you can carry that home, I'll give it to you. Now, I'm hoping this is going to work, but there's no sound. So <laughs> um, shall I just skip over it? It's, it's, it's a wonderful story, and it shows you how, what a great storyteller Daisy is. Um, and uh, he carries the barrel of flour home. Everybody is following him. They bring along jugs of hard cider and Jimmy John's. And um, when he gets up to the top of the hill, they all have a ginormous celebration. And um, 
here she's explaining how he puts the barrel on, on his um, shoulder. And um, then what she's saying is, my father, glory to his name, Alexander, my father. I'm proud to be your daughter. Here she goes. And he goes on up that hill. Sorry. Anyway, she, he, the, she ends the story by saying, and that's the truth, and I'll never <coughs> speak a word again. Uh, he is successful in clearing the land and then buying it up cheap. And he is eventually able to uh, build his own house. He starts, he came to Vermont in 1873 by, and, and at that point he's listed as a laborer. By 1877, he's listed as a farmer, which is quite incredible, because he had to clear the land. I mean, it's like colonial times. The, 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 Daisy said the trees were so thick, you couldn't put a chair in between them. And this is the house he built, and um, everybody helped. He had, by this time, become part of the community, and they, they shared work. Uh, I've been asked a number of times about the racism, as, as there was r certainly racism in Grafton, and what I think happened was that um, the town fathers were all abolitionists. Alec arrived, a former slave, and they wanted to help him, and so they shielded him. And he quickly threw his conduit in the general store. Uh, people came to know him and liked him, and he was a storyteller and a singer and fun. And um, he was just a magnetic man. And uh, the other thing was that a 100 men from Grafton had fought in the Civil War. And so there was a respect there, and certainly a conversation point. And um, so he, his grandchildren all told me that they did not feel discrimination until uh, they left Grafton. Now, as I said, he was a hill farmer, just like everybody else, and his family helped with the haying, with all the, the chores, and of course, um, with w when they uh, had large chores, they joined in with other uh, people in the other uh, hill farmers. Daisy uh, went to school right here. This is Daisy. This is her sister Susie and her twin brother Willie. So again, they were part of the community. And Alec, uh, this is his first grandson, Willie Samuels. Um, the homestead he built became a homestead for his family, and it was a gathering place. And uh, this uh, he ha had 13 children, and I'm just going to run through uh, most of them. Um, th the oldest was Rose, or she was one of the older twins, and she kept, uh, I wouldn't call it a diary, it was more an account book, but the interesting thing was she would say, Violet was here, and then she would date it or we picked five, five quarts of berries or 20 quarts of berries, and then she would date it. So by going through her account book, I was able to come up with a pretty good idea of what all the sisters and brothers were doing. And many of the sisters 
Rose was the first to leave the family and find a community down um, in Boston where there were many more African Americans. Rachel, her twin sister, um, went down to Everett Mass and became a practical nurse. And Nellie was the first uh, to marry. She also went down and never, she was one of the few that did not return to Vermont. Um, she, she married and had a son called Willie Samuels. He was the child you saw with Alec. Wonderful looking kid. Um, at 21, he was slated, he was a drummer. All the Turners were musical. Um, and he was slated to go to law school. And he went in a race, had an aneurysm, and died, which was r really tragic. Lindsay Turner was the oldest son, and he was born in 1875. And uh, it, he had two sons out of wedlock. One of them was Leslie Rogers. It was Bill and Leslie Rogers, and they were both brought up in the Rogers family. But I'm showing you this because it gives you a little insight into Grafton at this period. And um, his daughter, Janet Severance, never knew that Lindsay was her grandfather until she needed a passport and to go to Ireland. And she had to get her father's, her birth certificate. And her father's was listed as M, mulatto. And, you know, she'd never known anything about this. And she went off to Ireland and she was um, pretty mad. And so when she came back, her father was dead, but she went to see her mother. And sure enough, her mother told her that indeed um, her grandfather was Lindsay. And Janet's daughter, Tamara, then went and interviewed um, her uh, Janet's mother. And uh, it turns out her, she had been, you know, this was a very uncomfortable time. And uh, her parents had disowned her. A lot of the townspeople had disowned her. And uh, Janet, thinking back, uh, remembered a number of incidents that she realized later were racially sparked but she had thought was really because they were poor. Anyway, it's an interesting insight into um, uh, the times. Now, this is David Rogers, Tamara's cousin, and she went to him and told him that uh, the st family story. And um, he pulls off his hat and said, now I know what the problem is every time it rains. And his hair would get all frizzy. And um, he then went and started telling his friends and discovered they all knew. Grafton had not forgotten, which I think, again, is interesting. It was also David Rogers that allowed us to do a genome test linked with the, the son of a son of a son of a son on the Y chromosome, and it came back that he was Yoruba, as Daisy had said um, their people were. Now this is Willie Samuels. I, I showed you the photograph of the school and the twins, Susie and Willie. Willie won the Croix de Guerre in the First World War. And this is his twin sister, Susie Lanier, who married Cheston Lanier. And one of their children was Ronnie Lanier, who um, was a lot like Daisy, except she wasn't cantankerous. She was quite loving and an amazing woman. Uh, she was the first Bap black Baptist minister in New England and um, really loved. She was also, all these grandchildren have this marvelous athletic ability. She had her letter in about 
15 different sports and, and had some, recently was awarded some prize for that. And her brother, Chester, won the Golden Gloves in 1932. So you see this talent coming down. Now this is Daisy, but before we get to Daisy, there was an eighth child called Alexander, and he was nicknamed Enough. <laughs> but after Enough, they had five more girls, and Daisy was the first. Enough, unfortunately, died at nine months of, of uh, pneumonia. Now this is Daisy. Daisy never married, but um, she was a pretty stylish woman, and she was engaged to be married uh, to this white man, and uh, about the time of their wedding, her father took seriously ill and died, and she went home to Vermont and dealt with that, and when she came back, she discovered that her husband-to-be had been with another woman. And so she brought suit for breach of promise. This is a black woman against a white man in Massachusetts, East Cambridge, 1927, and she won a suit of $3,700. And this is with 12 white male jurors, which is quite something. And uh, there's a wonderful photograph of her in the globe, and underneath it says, I have been vindicated. Violet was the first to marry a white man. He was a local, George Hall, he was a local uh, Chester Grafton resident. And um, Alec was very much against uh, his daughters marrying white men. He, he felt that because of slavery, he didn't want his daughters experiencing anything close to what he had witnessed. And indeed, um, I think both Violet and George experienced quite a bit of, of racism. And um, I don't know whether you can read that. It says, um, I am coming to Chester next week. Don't run to Nigger Hill, which was where Violet supposedly lived. So again, there was definite racism. And this is Godfrey, uh, George and Violet's younger son, who kept that card all his life. Um, he was just a wonderful guy, and, and this photograph is his last walk up Turner Hill. And I went with he and, a co and his cousin, and I suddenly felt I was inhabiting <clears throat> the Turner story, because every rock, every tree, every, and the brook coming down, they all had stories um, all along the way. Zebby was named after Zephy. She was the little girl that taught Alec how to read. And um, she was the first daughter born in the new house. So she was honored with that name. And here is Evelyn, who also married um, a white man. Uh, David Carlson, he was a Swede. And these are two of her daughters. This, this one here is Joanna. She was the other cousin that I walked up Turner Hill uh, with. And this is Florida, the youngest. And I've, uh, she also married um, a white man, an Italian, uh, Di Benedetto. Now this is the other Rogers boy, Bill Rogers, Leslie Rogers' older brother. Um, and imagine, of course Grafton knew. Um, they were raised in the Rogers family, two of nine other children. And um, they didn't blend in, obviously, very well. 
And here is, you know, the family seat with all the Turners. This is Daisy here, and this is her mother, and all of the sisters and brothers, Uncle Early. Um, and it became the family seat. And this was what really Sally and Alec had always dreamed about. And um, imagine coming from slavery, never thinking that you would own um, 160 acres on a hillside in Vermont. And Daisy, this is at her 104th birthday, she kept the story. She kept it alive. And so what we have is a unique two centuries of a critical time in our history, an important family saga with a different voice. And we don't get that very often. In fact, I know of no other story like it. So she did her job well. Thanks. Hi. Hi. How, do you know where in Maine the slate was born? Yes, it was Williamsburg, Maine, right near um, Williamsburg and Brownville. And it's in the center of nowhere. The yeah, yeah. No, there are a number of slate quarries up there, but um, the records were what well, were terrific to find. Any other questions? Probably 1983. I'm a slow worker. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about Daisy's life? About Daisy's life? Uh, sure. She. she um, she was born in 1883. She had rickets as a child and um, couldn't get around as well as her brothers and sisters. And this is probably when she learned to use her voice. Um, her father built her a little machine, that she, a chair sort of thing that she could push around the kitchen and it would go up as she grew taller. Um, and uh, she went to school. Uh, she, she learned to walk, I think, uh, she finally could walk by the time she was five, and then eventually went off to school, I guess, at six. And then there, in school was the time that she first stood up, and there was a, a um, at the end of school, the teacher asked, the class each to take a doll to represent a different country. She was given the black doll and she didn't want to do it but she said she talked to her father and he convinced her to do it and so she goes and she learns the piece then she learns that she's going to have to wear a, a, a dress she's worn to school before while everybody else is wearing white dresses and that she's going to be at the end of the program. And so the day of the occasion comes and she gets madder and madder and madder that she is put in this position. So when it comes her turn at the end, she says she's not going to go out. And instead of reciting the, the teacher begs her to go out and lets her wear a watch and gives her a dollar. And she goes out and then she totally makes up um, another poem, which I can recite to you, but it goes on forever, um, saying, you know, you needn't crowd my dolly out, although she's black as night. And she goes on and she wins the first prize. Uh, then uh, she stands up again. I think she's probably 14, and her father sells turkeys and all kinds of poultry just before Thanksgiving to um, Boston, the Boston market. And he gets back a check 
worth half of what they expected. She goes down on the train, identifies the poultry, her father used to clip off the back toe, and shames the Boston market guy, and her father gets full payment. Um, so there are those kinds of stories. She finally, um, she goes down to be a secretary, but um, she faces some discrimination there and leaves. And um, I think at, at that point she's 18, and here was a case where she goes into class and she, you know, she's suddenly in Boston, not on home turf, and so she does not stand up for herself. She, she does leave. So, uh, you know, uh, I think it's important to, to realize that, too, that she is human. She's not superhuman. And uh, she spends on and off 30 years in Boston, but always coming back to Vermont and um, when her mother dies, she believes that somebody needs to come back and take over the home place so that the grandchildren, who always come every summer, can still have a place to come. And so she did that until the house was burned in, 1860, in 1962. And um, then, uh, after that, she moved to the village with her sister, Zebby. Zebby was living in the village. Zebby had a very successful sort of catering, uh, or yeah, catering, I guess you'd call it business. And, um, you know, she lived to be 100 and, and four. <laughs> yes? If you're interested in, in, in Daisy, uh, the Folk Life Center produced both an audio documentary and a video documentary that the library has. Um, also on prx.org, you can listen to the whole audio series. Yes. Jane, could, could you say something about the killing of the, uh, of these, was it the slaveholder that he killed? Of the overseer, yeah. possibly. Was there no attempt to catch him, or how did he get away with it? Uh, well, he was with these 20 uh, First New Jersey cavalrymen, and he slipped off. The, the overseer's house was just a half a mile away, and while they're capturing the vedettes, he goes and shoots Pusley, then comes back. He leaves Pusley there, and he goes back across the river that night, carrying, um, and, and they carried extra horses and wine from the wine cellar, even though Golden was supposed to be a teetotaler. I guess wine didn't count. Um, and, and he goes back with the 1st New Jersey Cavalry, so that's how he got away with it. And there's, I have no record of him actually, I, don't, I, I cannot prove that he shot the overseer, but the fact that he told that story more than any other story says to me it's true. And Alec was a very good chronicler. And um, there are all kinds of story, um, document, there's all kinds of documentation of that raid, three or four or five different sources, plus um, uh, the captain's letter to his father. Mm -hmm.